I try to talk about the rise of Keynes's economics. And that's not necessarily the same thing as Keynesian economics, but we went from Keynes's struggle to break free of the orthodoxy of his day, so Marshallian orthodoxy, and uh, find the specific things that he thought were wrong. And in retrospect, he focuses on two things. One is the idea that the real wage automatically uh, moves to bring you full employment, and he provides a series of, of objections to that, which in the end could be uh, uh, open to interpretations inevitably. But w after general theory, he concedes that the real wage will move downward if there's massive unemployment. Now, that's a classical argument, too, and it's not hard to observe empirically. So, But his argument is that it takes so long and creates such social distress that there is no reason to solve the problem of unemployment by waiting until the real wage has fallen. Rather, the state should step in and pump up the employment and avoid all the misery and distress. And don't forget that he's been observing these problems from the 1920s onward. So he's not talking about some abstract issue. He's talking about the end of World War I and the great periods of misery and persistent poverty and unemployment after that in Europe, in the most developed part of the capitalist world. The second thing is that he also needs to block the claim that if unemployment caused the uh, rate of interest to fall, then the net rate of return on investment, which is the profit rate minus the interest rate, would expand because the interest rate would be falling. That would make investment rise, which would create aggregate demand to rise, even on his own argument. And that would bring you back to full employment. So he needs to block that also. And he does that by switching from the loanable funds theory of the interest rate to the liquidity preference theory of the interest rate. And we went through that last time. And you can see the logic of the switch. He arrives at this switch because he needs to block the two counter arguments that could be made uh, against his break. So uh, we then talked about the, that was picked up, became the dominant policy foundation in the 1960s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s in all the capitalist world. Because once you, you say that the market will not bring you to full employment automatically, or if it does, it brings you at slow and possibly high cost, because the rate of unemployment that would bring you to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the rate of inflation that would bring you to a normal rate of unemployment, a desirable rate of unemployment, uh, might not be achieved automatically. You then come to the idea the state can do it. The state can pump up the economy. If it pumps it up, it'll bring you to full employment. But then comes the issue of inflation. You see, again, the, how it flows quite naturally from the, from the project itself. Once you say that the state intervenes to <coughs> pump up employment, therefore to reduce unemployment, you're facing the question of what point does that get to be too low and that lead to inflation. And that's what made Phillips the Phillips curve so important. Phillips was not asking the question about inflation and unemployment. Phillips was asking a prior question, which is, what's the relationship between unemployment and money wages? And Phillips found a downward sloping relationship between the rate of change of money wages and the rate of unemployment. And that became translated into a, a relationship between inflation and unemployment by assuming that prices change in proportion to money wages. Well, that's essentially a markup theory of, of prices, because prices are marked up on costs. Costs are broken into two parts, wages and materials costs. And materials costs, however, are broken down into wages and the materials costs of the materials and so on. And this way, you can reduce all of the materials costs to direct and indirect wages and profits, the direct and indirect markups, in fact. And that can lead to the idea that the price level is essentially dependent on the money wage. This is, if you recall from the last semester, Adam Smith's decomposition of the price into direct and indirect wages and profits. But if the profits are a voluntary decision-making variable that firms create in the aggregate by deciding how much profit they want as a markup, 
and prices are a reflection of that, then prices reflect money wages. Everybody follow me here? Okay. Now, I argued against this last semester. I, I don't believe the argument of markup pricing is correct, either in terms of individual price setting by firms, which is the normal case in perfect competition, or in the theory of inflation. In this course, we're going to come back to that second aspect of the theory of inflation. If, if prices are not determined by costs, then what does determine prices? And we're going to come to a different construction than we are now going to examine today, which is Friedman's explanation of where prices come from, which is in the quantity theory of money. And that develops in Friedman, Phelps, Lucas, and so on, and to become standard. So this uh, lecture will focus on the uh, uh, rise of, of uh, neo Walrasian economics, and then the next lecture, since I'm going much slow, more slowly than I thought, will be on post Keynesian economics and Goodwin and all of that, because there's a lot of depth and detail there that we need to discuss. Okay. The thing to understand about Keynesian economics is that it comes to power in the 1930s because of the inability of neoclassical theory to explain the events of the Great Depression, at least in a convincing fashion. Keynes claimed that his, general, his theory was the general theory, and neoclassical theory was a special case, only applicable to full employment. So Keynes says, I'm the general theorist, and you guys are just talking about a full employment, but I'll make you the important theory by bringing you to full employment. He actually says this. He will reinstate neoclassical theory by showing how capitalism can be brought to full employment and then would make neoclassical theory correct. The trouble is that Keynes' uh, neoclassical theory comes back in power in the 1970s for this exactly the reason that Keynesian theory cannot explain the phenomena that it's now facing, which is the collapse of the Phillips curve, the inability to explain why inflation and unemployment are moving in the wrong direction. Remember from the Phillips curve, if the inflation rate is up here, the unemployment rate is, is low, uh, is uh, high, is high. If, if you bring the unemployment, no, don't think that backwards here. Uh, Phillips, I'm doing backwards from my side, so let me see. I tried to do it, yeah, okay. So inflation is high, the unemployment rate is low. As uh, inflation comes down, the unemployment rate should become higher. That's a standard implication of the Phillips curve. What we found in practice is that the inflation rate went up and the unemployment rate went up also, which is not consistent with the Phillips curve. So there was a scramble to figure out shifting Phillips curves, expectation-oriented, uh, augmented Phillips curves, which I'm going to come back to, on the Keynesian side. And that then in the hands of Friedman and Phelps and others becomes the thing that uh, knocks Keynesian theory off the perch of policy and economic theory because uh, they explain it in a way that is now bringing back the idea that there's full employment and that the inflation is due to Keynesian policy itself. How does that happen? Well, I'm going to come to that in a minute, but what's interesting is that now neoclassical theory says Keynesian theory is a special case and neoclassical theory is general. This is already the, happening uh, in the 1950s and uh, 60s by um, Samuelson's uh, influential restatement of economics in a Marshallian mathematical terms, which dominates the field. The Samuelson textbook was something, uh, when I came to graduate school, is still the standard textbook um, that was used everywhere. And there, the explanation of unemployment was due to an imperfection in the labor market. That's the principal infection, but it could be in the commodity market. But essentially, wages were downwardly rigid in nominal terms. Then they would not adapt to unemployment easily. And this would explain why there was a long period of unemployment with persistent unemployment because it was really the rigidity of markets, especially labor markets. From that neoclassical point of view, Keynesian theory is a special case because it is only applicable to rigid prices of some sorts. And so rigidity becomes the thing to 
look for in explaining why the system doesn't work the way that uh, neoclassical theory says it should. Um, Keynes even suggests something like this when he talks about how the wages respond slowly and they depend on other people's comparison of their wages to fellow workers and so on. But this leads to an implication which Keynes would reject, which is that if wages were flexible and prices were flexible, then the system would move rapidly back to full employment. Because if there was unemployment, money wages would fall, and real wages would presumably fall. If the real wages fall, the demand for labor will rise, and uh, that will bring you back towards the full employment level. So the idea that wage rigidity was the cause of Keynesian type phenomena was then linked to the idea that the absence of wage rigidity would bring you back to the uh, things that Keynes was trying to break free of, which is the neoclassical uh, or the pre-Keynesian arguments. And this is done then by relocating macroeconomics on a Marshallian, on a, a Walrasian rather, uh, micro foundations. So the emphasis of micro foundations becomes also central. Uh, and the claim is that Keynes or Keynesian theory doesn't have adequate micro foundations. Now, I've already argued that the micro foundations of neoclassical economics are, are uh, not supportable. They're inconsistent. Uh, uh, I also argue in, in this semester that Keynesian theory, uh, they're, I'm sorry, they're inconsistent because firms, if they knew that they were part of a whole, which they must know because they have perfect knowledge by implication, then when they do something, they know that everyone else will do the same thing, which means that they, if they increase output, price must fall. So they cannot take the demand curve to be horizontal. They must understand that the demand curve faced by a, even a tiny firm would be downward sloping. And that means you can't draw that horizontal line, which you call the uh, demand curve in, in uh, neoclassical theory. You have the U-shaped cost curve, and then you have a line which is given, and that line is supposed to represent the demand faced by the individual firm. And that tells you the firm is supposed to think that it can sell as much as it wants at any given price because its effect on the market is so small. But of course, that assumes something which is logically inconsistent with the, own, with the theory itself, which is that firms know that there are other firms. And, therefore, and they know that the other firms are just like them. Therefore, whatever they do, they must know is magnified. They must therefore know that their demand curve is downward sloping. Now, Keynes, unfortunately, does not pick this up. Uh, and so therefore, it's interesting to say, what is the micro foundations of Keynes? On one hand, he's trying not to attack neoclassical theory, because he knows perfectly well that it's going to be impossible then to break through. So he says, well, you're not wrong. It's just that it doesn't work that way in practice. But if you allow me to save you, by allowing the state into the story and bringing you back, then your story will work. But even as he says that as a kind of political uh, statement uh, to, to keep his colleagues and powerful colleagues from attacking him more than they already were, he is at the same time talking about how firms behave. So he says, well, firms must take demand into account. They base their production on expectations, on the expectations of sales and demand. And they understand that this demand is downward sloping. And therefore, suddenly, he's also saying that the neoclassical theory cannot be right. But he doesn't get to the point of establishing the micro foundations for his own argument. And that becomes the task of Keynesians, who, of course, typically split into many different factions that disagree with each other. I would argue that Keynesian theory is perfectly logically consistent and better posed in terms of the theory of real competition downward sloping demand curves for the individual firm. And production takes time, so firms base themselves on expect expected sales, which are both expected quantities and uh, expectation of price and all of that. And I talked about it last semester in terms of real competition. But now you can see that that quite naturally leads to the issue that the firm will be demand sensitive.
Now, demand sensitive means that the firm is a price setter. That price setting is limited by the effects of the behavior of other firms and by demand. So it's not a Koletskian firm. It's not a market. It's not a markup setter. It's a price setter. And the markup is a residual between the cost it inherits from labor and other firms and the price it can maintain in the market. And that local price it is a conditional one, it's a temporary one, because if it creates for the regulating capitals profit rates which are higher in one sector than the other, then capital will flow in and bring the price down. If it's too low in one sector, if the profit rate is too low, capital flows out of that sector, supply shrinks, and the price goes up. So in the end, though firms set prices, they don't determine the prices. The relative prices are determined by competition, and that makes perfect sense because when you look at competition that firms face, you look at the business literature, they say, of course we set prices. But it doesn't mean you can set them at any level. If we could set them at any level, we'd set them at infinity and get that maximum profits. But as soon as we raise them above a certain level, capital flows in, other firms cut their prices, so they're always facing this pressure of competition. I argued last semester also that this same understanding of real competition can explain Koletsky's observation that firms have different costs that comes about from the introduction of new technology, which comes about from the, f the fact that firms themselves are constantly forced to introduce new technologies to lower their cost, and that price cutting by uh, dominant firms uh, forces other firms to decrease their price. You get a spectrum of prices, a spectrum of costs, that's a dynamic process of adjusting to real competition. And from this, you can explain pretty much Koletsky's observed relationship between markups, costs, and prices. But not because firms set the markup, but because the markup is set by their pricing policy. And we're going to come to that in, in the next lecture. I'm talking in more detail about the Koletsky and macro implications uh, and their uh, explanation from a classical point of view. So now we come to the rise of, or the return of the empire, so to speak. This is the empire strikes back, and then the first strike comes from Friedman and Phelps. Now, Friedman himself, before he bring, makes this strike, was a quantity theorist. And the quantity theory of money can be traced back to Hume and others in the 18th century. In the original form, the quantity theory is simply the observation of an accounting identity, which is that, that the sum of transactions, which is the total price times the total quantity sold in a particular period, perhaps multiple transactions, will be equal to the quantity of money times the time, number of times the money turns over. So we sell. $10,000 worth of product here, and there's only a supply of, of $1,000 of money circulating, then obviously that money must have circulated 10 times, according to this hypothesis, in order to account for the transactions of 10,000. So this is an accounting identity. But where the accounting identity becomes interesting is how you specify the M, V, and P, Q. And that's where uh, the quantity theory of money comes in. Marx also adheres to this in the theory of money. Uh, and I'm going to, I talked about that last semester in the chapter on the theory of money, but now we're going to come to a different set of implications uh, about inflation and so on in the classical tradition. So Friedman begins by saying that, by, by uh, I'm sorry, no, Friedman doesn't begin that. Let me begin by talking about the classical quantity theory of money, because it's important to see that it's a different explanation than the Friedman one. It's a different hypothesis. The original form is translated into a causal relationship by saying that uh, the output is a function or the growth of output, because really classical theory is all about growing systems, not static. The growth of output is determined by profitability. 
And the velocity of money is determined by social structure, rules that have been set up about exchange and payments and so on. So that determines the velocity of money and the growth of output is determined by profitability. Therefore, the, a change in the money supply will have an effect on prices depending on how the money supply changes relative to growing output. An important point, relative to growing output. Suppose output is growing at 3%. If velocity is constant, then price will be constant if the money supply is growing by 3%. You see that very similar argument comes up in, in Friedman. Everybody follow that? So now, if for any reason output uh, money supply starts rising by 10%, the discovery of gold mines or some print, in those days not so much printing of money, but uh, discovery of supplies of gold coming from outside or uh, export surpluses bringing money into the country. Then in the quantity theory, this increase in the money supply will lead to an increase of price in the long run, not in the short run. Because in the short run, the quantity theory is understood perfectly well that it can lead to an increase in output. So that the output may increase above its profit motivated growth rate. It was well understood in the classical quantity theory of money and in the Hume-Ricardo version especially, that in the short run an increase in the money supply could affect prices, wages, interest rates, profits, and the level of production. Because the idea that the, the long run growth rate is determined by normal profitability is consistent with the idea that profitability can rise above normal if you pump up the economy. But then as capacity expands, the profitability comes back to normal, depending on what happens to wages and productivity and so on. So important issue here is that you see that the quantity is determined by other factors than money. In this case, it's determined by profitability. But that does not imply that the quantity is such that you have full employment of labor. The classical quantity theory money did not require that the output is determined by the full employment supply of labor, full employment use of labor. And in fact, whether or not it leads to full employment depends on the effects of unemployment on profitability. But now you come to a, a, a point of departure, which I'm going to come back to in a later lecture, which is that Marx also has the same relationship, MV equals PQ, at a certain level of abstraction, not fiat money, but at gold money and convertible and inconvertible token money. And here, uh, the quantity is determined by profitability. The rate of growth is determined by profitability. But Marx does not argue that the resulting level of employment is full employment. And that's because there's an endogenous argument in Marx, to which I'll come back to, which is that the system creates a persistent level of unemployment. Now, if that's the case, then the MV equals PQ, in, at least in the Marx side of the story, is very different than the MV equals PQ in the Friedman side of the story. Even though the argument about the reserve army of labor in Marx is based specifically on flexible real wages. So the difference is not the flexibility of the real wages. It can't be because both have the same argument about flexible real wages. It is something else about the way the flexibility plays out that in the neoclassical story gives you full employment and in Marx's reserve army of labor gives you a persistent rate of unemployment. That point clear? So if Marx were to be resurrected like the dinosaurs in those movies and brought back, he would definitely argue that real wages are flexible. That's the key to his own argument in, in chapter 25 of volume one, the reserve army of labor. But he would not concede that the flexibility of real wages leads you to full employment. That's a neoclassical argument. And uh, is an interesting paper topic is what's the difference then if both sides have flexible real wages, what's the real difference between the full employment argument and the reserve army of labor argument? How many people have read that chapter in Marx uh, on the reserve army of labor? So if you recall, 
that what he says is that as the reserve army shrinks, if, if demand is growing strongly for any reason, uh, and the reserve army shrinks, then wages will begin to rise. And as wages begin to rise, uh, and the reserve army keeps a shrink, that at some point they will call, and, and I'm sorry, as wages begin to rise, profitability will begin to fall, and at some point they will change the process of the growth rate because output growth depends on profitability, so it'll reduce the growth rate of output and it'll restore the r normal rate of unemployment. It may go above and below it, but it'll cause it to cycle around it. The famous representation that of, in a formal sense of that is Goodwin, Goodwin's predator-prey model. Uh, yes, and since Vela is not here, I can say I don't agree at all. <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. And I'm going to come to you. You can ask me that question again. The question was, is Marx's rate of normal unemployment the same thing as Friedman's rate of natural unemployment? And I'm going to argue exactly the opposite. But let me come to Friedman so that you can see, then ask me the question again. It's a good question. OK. So now we come to Friedman himself. Friedman is the new quantity theory of money. And so the question is, how does he change this classical story, the Ricardo Hume story, into a new story? It's interesting that if you read the book by Nicholas Wapshot called Keynes Hayek, which I recommend strongly, it's a really interesting, uh, entertaining, enlightening book about the politics and battle between Hayek and Keynes uh, in their time with uh, the the neoclassical bastion, which was LSE, bringing in Hayek to counter the Keynesian bastion, which was uh, Cambridge. And the book says something here which I've always found very interesting and I don't know anything more about uh, because I haven't had time to follow it up. But it says, Friedman started out as a socialist and became a Keynesian then before he became an anti-socialist, anti-Keynesian. Friedmanite. So there's an interesting part of Friedman's early history that seems to have been uh, covered up, and uh, Wapshop may provide citation for that. The first thing Friedman does is to say that this whole relationship should be expressed in terms of demand and supply of money, as in Keynes. So he takes the Keynesian apparatus, which is dominant by that time in the 50s, and he situates the quantity theory in terms of demand and supply. And remember that when Keynes is writing, Keynes does actually argue that the state determines the money supply. So Friedman picks up on that and says, OK, the money supply is given exogenously by the state. So the money supply is given exogenously by the state. The question is, uh, and the price is a result, the price variable is a result of that, then the question is, What's the relationship between V and P? You can see, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Q and V. Those are the two variables that you need to have uh, explained. Uh, Friedman starts by saying, well, the demand for money, which is going to have to be equal to the supply of money, is determined at the micro level by a variety of factors. So he's talking about individual micro demands of money, individual uh, uh, agents, determined by real income of the individual, the rate of return on financial a assets, alternatives to holding money. You can see the liquidity preference story in here. Uh, institutional factors. You can see the classical argument there about how the mean way of paying money and holding money and arrangements of transferring money become important. And personal preferences, because some individuals may hold more money, may prefer more. So he has all of those elements in there. But then, like every good macroeconomist, he says, when you aggregate all these individual demands for money, you end up with a relationship, which I posit to be very straightforward, which is that, first of all, the functional form is no longer the same. All of these different micro functional demands for money in aggregate show up in a very simple and uh, uh, different way in which um, um, 
the demand for money depends essentially on uh, uh, income and the price level. So it's a real demand for money that depends on real income. And in fact, this demand for money supply relationship translates in a, into a velocity of circulation which varies in Friedman in response to historical events and changes in institutions. And Friedman says that the long run and short run are different in the velocity of money because in the short run, changes in the money supply can influence the velocity of currency, velocity of money, and can affect output and hence affect employment in the short run. Uh, he points himself to the empirical short run pro-cyclical variations uh, in uh, velocity of money, but in the long run, a secular decline in the velocity of money. In the end, the major factor determining the stock of money the, is the change in nominal income. The nominal stock of money affects nominal income. And so he ends up with a relationship in which the uh, money relative to output, the mon uh, demand for money relative to output equal to the supply of money equal relative to output, so that changes in the supply of money end up changing nominal output because the other factors are determined are real factors. So the, from this, uh, he moves then on to empirical work with a famous work with Schwartz, Anna Schwartz, in 1963, and they look at the per capita money supply, which they took as a, demand, as a proxy for per capita money demand. Remember that if M is a supply of money, if you have MD equals MS, then M is also a proxy for the demand for money. That's an assumption, but he uses it to translate into an empirical statement. And his argument is that an increase in the money supply relative to output, so you notice that's a classical argument again, it's an issue of the money supply relative to output, would lead to an increase in nominal income. He specifically argues increase in money supply per capita increase in money supply would lead to a per capita increase in income. So that's another way of saying that if the velocity is stable, then an increase of M leads to an increase of PQ of equal magnitude, roughly equal magnitude, in the long run. In the short run, not necessarily, but in the long run. Everybody follow me here? So his first set of arguments, his early arguments, say that, well, then you want to keep the money supply growing at a stable rate in order to keep nominal output growing at a stable rate. But he's criticized for not being able to explain under what conditions does the increase of the money supply translate into an increase of prices rather than an increase of quantity. Because if I say that the increase of the money supply increases nominal output, then I can't say whether this nominal output increase is translating into a Keynesian effect, which is increase of output, physical output, real output, at a given set of prices. So it could be that if nominal output rises is because the Q is rising and the P is constant, or it could be because the Q is constant and the P is rising. So you won't be a full Friedmanite, so to speak. He can't be a full Friedman unless he can associate an increase of the money supply with an increase in the price level. And to do that, he has to have some explanation for output not changing. Now, of course, as I said in the classical argument, it's because output is driven by profitability. But Friedman ends up actually uh, going back to the ISLM model, the Hicksian, so-called Keynesian ISLS model, and he says that the output is determined by the labor supply. So he's bringing back into the story the idea that the real wage makes output uh, at the full employment level. Because once you say that, then the output is determined by the supply of labor, which is exogenous uh, in, the, in the large. There's some flexibility. The labor supply does respond to wages, but they, uh, it's dependent in large part on growth of population. So 
you have here a variable which is fixed by the availability of labor. And in that case, inflation comes about if money supply rises faster than the full employment rate of output. Now that plays a central role in all the macroeconomics, even if the exact story has changed a little bit from then on. Notice that it assumes that you have a full employment uh, output. And therefore, it follows that inflation is a full employment phenomenon in Friedman and in the neoclassical story. It's full employment. Everybody understand that? Make sense? Notice that inflation is also a full employment phenomena in Keynesian theory. Because as the unemployment rate shrinks, you begin to have inflation. So the real, at the most abstract level, you have just an increase of output. When you hit full employment, then you get inflation. But in practice, you get a curve rather than this L-shaped curve like that. You get a curve that rises, and that's a Phillips curve kind of story. But really, full employment is the sort of somewhere around full employment where you expect inflation to become a problem, right? So both theories have inflation associated with near full employment. And this is important because I'm going to argue later that inflation is not due to a full employment or labor supply constraint at all, but something else. It's due to an output constraint, but not the labor supply constraint. Now, a, a, a second di difficulty with Friedman's uh, path towards his own argument is that if the output is fixed at full employment and you increase the money supply, then the price level will rise. But that just means that the price level was like this, and you increase the money supply. Money supply is like this. You increase it up to a new level, then the price will be like this. It goes up to a new level and stays there. And that's not inflation. That's a jump in price level going from zero inflation to another level of zero inflation. Everybody follow me? So you can't explain inflation this way. You can explain the price level, which is now dependent on the path of money, money supply, but you can't explain inflation. For to explain inflation, you have to have the money supply rising relative to output. And that's the old classical point again. Output is rising at the rate determined by the supply of labor. So the money supply, if it's rising at the same rate, will give you stable prices. But if it's rising too fast, it'll give you inflation. Okay. Now notice it follows from this that the cause of inflation is the state. Because the state determines the money supply. And therefore, so except for shocks, exogenous shocks, the money supply is in the hands of the state. You notice what a threat this is right away to the Keynesian argument. The Keynesian argument is the state is a means to full employment. Friedman is saying the state is the cause of inflation. So, Friedman can get around all the other problems, the, how to hold the Q, how to determine the Q, how to determine the V, the determination of the money supply, and therefore the price level is then given by the story, by the, all these other factors. Friedman's story comes into power, so to speak, in the early 60s. He's doing his work earlier than that, but it becomes important in the 60s and then the 70s. And it becomes central in the overthrow of Keynesian economics. Because he then provides a different explanation for inflation, which is that, uh, which the Keynesians were not able to do. He provides an explanation, and he also provides a way to reinstate classical, uh, uh, neoclassical economics. But it's interesting to observe that by the 1980s, by 1979 even, another Friedman, Benjamin Friedman, does an article pointing out that the correlation between uh, money supply and inflation has already broken down. So Friedman is a lucky man because he gets into that story and gets the Nobel Prize and all of that just in time to have the story collapse because it's no longer true. Just like the Phillips curve collapsed and that killed off Keynesian economics, the quantity theory relation between money supply and prices collapses all over the world, by the way. But Friedman's already home free, so to speak. He's got uh, the, the accolades for having developed the theory.
the nice thing about economics is that it's seldom affected by the facts. And that means you can keep on saying what you're saying, regardless of whether the facts hold or not. It's much harder in physics, by the way, to do that. So in the end, the new quantity theory of money that Friedman lasted no longer than the Keynesian theory that it overthrew as a policy and practical matter. So that brings me to the key point of the lecture today, which is this idea of the inflation and the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, Phelps is a key player in this. He doesn't, he isn't, doesn't call it the natural rate, but since it's often called that, I'm going to stick to that. I have a big section in there talking about how Phelps is different from Friedman, but for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on Friedman here. Everybody knew in the Keynesian story that a um, certain portion of unemployment was what they call frictional, voluntary, in the sense that there are people who are living over here and they have a job but they haven't made the move, or they have lost their job and they are going to get one soon so they can't really be counted as unemployed because they sort of know they're going to get a job. So this uh, movement between jobs is one source of frictional unemployment. And everybody knows that there are some people who chose not to work even if there were jobs available. So everybody knew at, at one point there'd be a certain number of vacancies and there'd be a certain number of people looking for work. Maybe the, they're living here and the vacancies are over there. So they have to make the move and it's expensive to make the move. You lose your place, your family, your connections, your culture, whatever. So there's going to be always a pool of frictional unemployment. But as long as the vacancies and the unemployed are sort of roughly in the order of magnitude, then that's just a question of the reason they don't get together. It may be of structural reasons, informational reasons, and so on. But when Keynesians are looking at the data and they see 7%, 5%, 4%, they're seeing that maybe frictional is 2%, but the rest is uh, involuntary unemployment. So maybe 2% uh, are people who are not able to make the move or not willing to make the move. They don't have the information to where the jobs are. But there are another 3% here that don't have jobs and want to work. So the question in the Keynesian sense was always that if the unemployment rate was small, then maybe it's only frictional. But if it's bigger than a certain number, maybe bigger than 2 or 3%, then it's involuntary. And those are people looking for work, so they're truly unemployed. And that leads the Keynesians to say, well, then we want to go back to the Phillips curve and ask at what level can, uh, do we want to bring the unemployment rate, if you remember, This is the original Phillips curve. This is the Phillips curve on the, on the vertical axis. You have the inflation rate. And the horizontal axis, you have the unemployment rate. And the zero inflation rate, it happens to be with this empirical uh, pattern in the United States in the 1970s, would have been 7% unemployment. And Keynesians would surely believe that most of that 7% was involuntary, was something people looking for work and not able to find it. And therefore, they would want to move this rate maybe up here to 4% or maybe even to 3% and tolerate a certain amount of inflation in order to bring you down to effective full employment, bring you to the effective full employment rate. And it's precisely this kind of thing that Friedman reinterprets in a brilliant way. And he does it from the point of view of neoclassical theory. So the first thing that Friedman has to now do, given what he's already done in the quantity theory of money and all of that, he has to explain why the Q in his argument is at full employment. Remember the quantity theory of money says that it's operative. The money supply translates. Money supply translates into prices if the Q, the quantity, is somehow 
constrained by the growth of full employment supply. But now, facing the phenomena Friedman has, the difficulty that inflation has gone up, but the unemployment rate has gone up also, which the Keynesians can't explain, and that's what Friedman explains. And he does it in a uh, wonderful way by saying there is no unemployment, that the unemployment rate you're looking at empirically is actually a kind of expanded f frictional unemployment. So what he's basically saying is, look, here you had the Keynesian era. Inflation is low. Unemployment is around that 4.5, 4.7 benchmark in 55 to 70. Inflation is uh, less than 3%. But then, as the Keynesians found to their shock and dismay, unemployment rises to 7%, and inflation also rises. Now, for the Friedman argument to be true, uh, and the neoclassical argument to be true, the unemployment must have fallen down to here for the inflation to rise that fast. But Friedman says, in fact, it did, because this is all voluntary unemployment. It's unemployment coming about because people have given options to not work at the going wage. Unions cause wages to be too high, higher than the market clearing wage, which means that some people who would get jobs at a market clearing wage are unemployed. So there you have people who are involuntarily uh, unemployed but by other workers. So in, sense, in, in that sense, there are people who are uh, suffering because of benefits given to some workers. Uh, then, in the face of that, the state creates uh, uh, job assistance, it creates unemployment benefits, it creates ways of maintaining people at that lower level. Friedman says, well, that's interfering in the market. So you get a pool of people. Some of these people are unemployed because of their own fellow workers have wages too high. Others are unemployed because they're getting benefits from the state, and therefore, Really, what has happened is the unemployment rate is, if you allow for this, is, is uh, at the proper level. But inflation has gone up because Keynesians misinterpreting this rise in uh, declared unemployment as being true unemployment have pumped up the system. And every time they pump it up, uh, they give more benefits to workers. They keep the uh, unions in place so that the the if natural rate rises, or at least it stays where it is, and or they translate into inflation. So you can see the logic of that, right? And it's a brilliant move because it takes the Keynesian notion of unemployment and stands it on its head. It says, what unemployment? I don't see any unemployment. This is full employment. And Friedman's claim that this can be derived from Walrasian framework, Friedman says specifically, the natural rate of unemployment is the level that would be ground out by the Walrasian system of general equilibrium equations, provided there is embedded in them the actual structural characteristics of the labor and commodity markets, including market imperfections, stochastic variabilities in demand and supply, the cost of gathering information about job vac vacancies and labor availabilities, the cost of mobility, and so on. So if that's the case, then this is a structural unemployment rate. And of course, we know that Friedman is not saying that it's arbitrarily structural. It's, it's the structures, in fact, being created by the Keynesian state, the, the major element in creating this structure. Uh, Tobin says that Friedman's claim that this could be derived from Walras is complete speculation because no one has ever shown that a Walrasian system will give you a, an employment rate uh, of a particular sort due to these imperfections. But anyway, one can sort of see the logic of that. seems quite sensible. Uh, the key point is that the natural rate of unemployment, and let's suppose that this is what it is, 7%. Uh, in Friedman is determined by real factors. Determined by the state, 
real wages, unions, uh, unemployment benefits, all of those things that uh, are uh, embedded in the real structure of, the, of a post-war economy. And these are not affected, in, and including the real interest rate, these are not affected by money, which only has effect on nominal variables. Um, and for this reason, inflation comes about because the state, Keynesian state, mistakenly treats this unemployment rate as something that can be brought down without changing the structure. And in the process, they may even make it worse because they give more benefits to people who are unemployed and support the union, so they make the problem worse. And by pumping ag aggregate demand, they translate into more and more inflation. Any questions about this? You can see why this argument had tremendous appeal to those who already believed that the state was a source of many problems in post-war capitalism. And you can see why it was also viewed with great hostility by those who believe that the state was a solution to the problems of post-war capitalism that would otherwise occur. Friedman in, in actually goes on to say that most of these people are either in transition from one job to another or choosing not to work so that they are voluntarily unemployed. And look, it, it's not an uh, argument that uh, is easily dismissed. You could reasonably argue that if you provide uh, wages, I mean, provide income to people, they're less likely to take jobs that are horrible and low paid. So depending on the threshold that people can get, they're going to refuse some kinds of work. And that's a key point in Friedman. I'm going to regrettably skip uh, Phelps because I want to get to the key point, which is how this argument then translates into the idea of uh, expectation augmented uh, Phillips curves, and then the idea of the natural rate of unemployment and the potential for hyperinflation due to the Keynesian state. The first difficulty is to explain why pumping up in, uh, output, um, pumping up demand and creating output would lead at all to increases in employment. Because remember, if you are at full employment, then pumping up output should lead to just inflation. But it's well known and observed, and Friedman certainly understood this perfectly well, that pumping up demand does reduce unemployment. So the problem facing Friedman and Phelps also was to explain why pumping up demand initially reduces output in employment, but then subsequently seems to lead to inflation. That's how they have to tell the story. There's a short run effect, which is Keynesian, but the long run effect is uh, neoclassical, which is that inflation comes about. And so that's a task for Friedman. It's a task for Phelps. It's a task for Lucas and it's picked up all the way along in uh, neoclassical macroeconomics. Everybody understand that? It comes from the logic of the argument itself. If I say to you that uh, increasing money supply will increase out, uh, prices in the long run, Friedman has already said early on, but that's not true in the short run. Because we know that increasing money supply in the short run can increase output and increase employment. So then the question is why that's not sustainable. Because otherwise, the Keynesian says, OK, fine, we increase output and un uh, reduce unemployment till we get to full employment. Friedman's saying, no, you have full employment. Then they go, well, if we have full employment, then how come when we increase demand, 
unemployment falls. So Friedman needs to explain why full employment becomes smaller in the short run, if that's said correctly. Okay? And that's not a trivial problem because from a theoretical point of view, we're already there, so why do you move to a lower unemployment rate? And this is uh, where the, the argument about um, the expectation uh, augmented Phillips curves comes about. If the natural rate of unemployment is this, then why does the system ever go below that? And in order to explain this, Friedman and Phelps have to do it from a neoclassical microfoundations framework. They have to explain why firms and workers will uh, go to a lower unemployment rate when demand is pumped up. So here's how the argument works, let's say, in Friedman. We know that in perfect competition, firms only change their profit maximizing output if the relative price of their product rises. I think, think of what I just said. You have a U-shaped cost curve. You have a price level, which is the price given to the firm relative to the general price level. If that given price rises, then the firm has a reason to change its output. But otherwise, it doesn't, because the only variables are its cost and its price. So the first step is to say that firms mistakenly think that when you increase aggregate demand and prices rise, they make the mistake of thinking that because their price has risen, they're going to get more profits, because they don't realize that their costs are also rising from everybody else's prices rising. So it's a misperception problem. Everybody follow that? There, if I, if I had a U-shaped cost curve, and the firm knew that as its price rose, the cost curve would rise by the same amount, then in real terms, there's no change, and the output in in employment wouldn't change. Everybody got that? So they have to mistake it. And what they mistake is, when they see prices rising, they go, oh, I've given my cost, which I got last period, I bought these things, and I've got my wage contracts and everything. So my costs are the same. Prices have risen, so therefore I can expand output. And that, Friedman says, leads firms to create more jobs. So the unemployment rate falls. I mean, this is really brilliant. You have to appreciate the beauty of the logic. In the meantime, workers thinking that uh, prices are rising, um, they see their wages rising also, because it's part of the general rise in price levels. And so therefore, they think that, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, say that again. L l let me come back. To, I didn't say that right. So let me, let's leave it for firms in a minute. So we got to the point where firms mistake the general rise in the price level for a local price for them, forgetting that their costs are going to rise. And um, therefore, they increase output, they reduce, they increase employment, and they reduce the unemployment rate. So now you can explain why the unemployment rate goes below the natural rate, because firms make a mistake, they misperceive. And Friedman actually says if they knew that prices are going to rise or demand was going to rise generally, uh, they would have time to think this through and they wouldn't make this mistake. So further, the type of aggregate demand which has this effect is a surprise. It's an unanticipated increase in aggregate demand that creates this effect. Because if the state were to say, look, uh, two years from now I'm going to increase all the spending and everybody was in neoclassical, they'd say, oh, all price is going to rise, therefore my costs are going to rise also. There's no reason for me to change output. Other things may equal, everything will be the same. There'd be no change in the level of real production. So from this point of view, when firms catch on little by little, they say, oh, wait, well, we made a mistake because our prices rose, but so did our costs, so now we have to bring the output back down, profits have come back down. 
and therefore we go back towards a natural rate of unemployment. So that's one half of the story. So supply returns from this point of view to the natural unemployment rate level, which is the full employment level, and the increase of aggregate demand leads to inflation. But there's another side in Friedman's argument, which is the effect on workers. Workers, Friedman says, care about real wages. That's a classical argument. Workers don't just bargain for money without taking into account what the money will buy. So they make their money bargains about the standard of living, and that's a real wage. So if prices rise, then workers will see that their wage has not kept up with the rising prices, that the real wage is falling, and so therefore they will somehow fight for higher nominal wages. And the effect of that will be to uh, change their wage demand, and from the Phillips curve point of view, will be a shift of the Phillips curve itself. If they expect, if the Phillips curve depends on expectations, of price increases at any given expectation, you have a Phillips curve. But if they think a price is going to rise, the Phillips curve will shift upward. So combining those two, you get uh, the so-called expectation augmented Phillips curve. And again, the question is, why do workers make this mistake? Because they mistake the rise of their wages uh, I'm sorry, the, the reduction in their unemployment as being something persistent. Um, so there's also a misperception on the side of workers. I'm, I'm mixing up Friedman and Phelps. I'm trying to separate out Phelps as I'm speaking here. So uh, let me make sure I do that right. So let me work through now the key diagram in which this is represented. Here's the argument in Friedman. Uh, let me make sure I get this. So we begin here at the natural rate of unemployment. And there is an, a now an increase in aggregate demand in the system. And if everybody understood that prices are going to rise, uh, money wages are going to rise, but the unemployment rate is going to remain at effectively full employment, then the rise in prices would invoke a rise in the Phillips curve as workers take into account the new inflation. So the Phillips curve would jump up, and you'd go straight from here, uh, point here to here on the horizontal axis, from here to here. But the unemployment rate would be unaffected. So you'd get a pure quantity theory of money effect. You'd increase the money supply, increase aggregate demand, and you get a jump in the price level with no change in the unemployment rate. But of course, we observe in practice the unemployment rate falls. So Friedman wants to show why it falls and then why ultimately it'll still come back to the correct place, which is the same unemployment rate, but with higher inflation built into the story. So what is this? This is the original Phillips curve, not the inflation curve, but the rate of change of money wages. So this rate of change of money wages depends on the level of employment and the expected inflation. Because in order to be a change of real wages, it has to take the inflation into account. Everybody follow me here? So at any given rate of inflation, uh, expected inflation, workers will have a relationship between the unemployment rate 
and their rate of change of money wages. So in Friedman's argument here, um, I keep losing my place. Sorry, hang on a second. Yeah. So we, we start from here at point A at an unemployment rate, which is the uh, natural rate. And there's a jump in the rate of growth of money uh, demand, an unexpected jump in the rate of growth money demand. And firms misperceive that. They think that output, uh, that uh, their prices are rising, and, or at least faster than costs. So they increase output on unemployment and employment, so they reduce the unemployment rate, and they end up at B. Meantime, firms uh, observing the same, in, I mean, uh, workers observing the same uh, increase in, partial increase in prices, understand that their, their, their rate of inflation, expected rate of inflation, is now uh, higher. At, I'm sorry, let me, I, I screwed that up. Let me say that again. So the firms move unemployment down to B. At that level, the wage that firms, uh, the, the workers fight for is given by this Phillips curve. So that's point C. But as, it firm, as workers begin to perceive that inflation is taking place at a higher level than it was previously, their Phillips curve is going to shift up. Meantime, as firms realize that their costs are rising, which they hadn't properly taken into account due to inflation, they shift downward to a uh, lower level of output and therefore a higher level of employment. So the system moves that way. Now, that's not a full adjustment because the real inflation is fully adjusted here. So uh, workers catch on more, firms will catch on more, so they move in this general direction and they end up eventually at the point that they would have been jumped to if they knew that was coming and had time to anticipate everything. If they had, in other words, Chicago economists to explain to them what to do, then they would do nothing because you end up in the same place anyway. Work. Chicago economists would come to them, the government's going to increase spending, going to go off and fight a war in Iraq, prices are going to rise, uh, unemployment rate is going to stay the same, but because prices rise, wages must rise, so workers will say, okay, then our wages rise by 10%, and you jump right back to the same natural rate of unemployment level, only you're up here to compensate for the higher level of inflation. Now, notice Friedman does say that if everybody knew this was going to happen, they would jump there. But he has to explain why people don't do that, because he observes empirically. He already knew it from his studies, and every Keynesian would point out to him that actually that's not how it works. Yeah? That's basically Lucas, right? I mean, yes, that anticipates Lucas. So Lucas comes along and says, but, and I'm going to come to Lucas, they will in fact jump there. I mean, in effect, what Friedman is saying to anticipate Lucas is that we know this is what's happening, but the agents don't know. And Lucas is going, well, if you know, then they know, in which case these uh, misperceptions can't be true. But Lucas has, still has to explain the phenomena, so he doesn't say it's misperceptions, it's something else, lack of information. <coughs> so. Yes. If you just rationalize the cases then on the long run, you see the agents didn't happen. I'm going to come to rational expectations. So give me a chance to get there because I want to go uh, to the idea of Nehru first. Now notice what this says. This says that pumping up the economy will cause uh, ever rising uh, inflation because you mistake this level to be true unemployment where it's really full employment. And so as you pump it up, you get back the same level of unemployment. So you pump it up more, you, you get back the same level of unemployment. So what you're doing is really causing accelerating inflation. 
and ultimately, therefore, hyperinflation. So this is Friedman's explanation of why Keynesian economics is responsible for ever-rising inflation, because it mistakes full employment for unemployment. And it creates the larger level of voluntary unemployment by its own policy. So it's responsible on both levels. It creates this natural rate up here rather than down here, because it interferes in the market. And then in an effort to undo what it's done, it creates inflation also. And that brings me to the idea of Nehru automatically, which is the idea that the natural rate of unemployment is the rate at which the inflation rate is constant. And that if you pump it up, if you go beyond that, you try to reduce it Below that, you'll get accelerating inflation. Conversely, if for any reason you try to keep the unemployment rate higher than the natural rate, you get decelerating inflation. That's narrow. The natural, uh, what is narrow? Na Non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Now, I'm skipping over a little bit of the formal development, because it's pretty well known, and it's in the book. But I, I want you to understand the logic of the argument. Because people get so easily seduced by the algebra that they forget the reason for the algebra, the logic of it. Now, as I said, the, the, the task for Friedman and Feltz was to show how you could make an argument of a natural rate of unemployment and inflation coming from attempting to pump up the economy and still explain why. In the short run, you get a Keynesian result. They were trying to show why the Keynesian outcome was unstable. And in their argument, and not so much in Phelps, but in Friedman's argument, it's because of misperceptions, which eventually get corrected. And again, only misperceptions only rise if people don't expect the outcome. So if the, it's only unexpected demand increases that creates this misperception, which is what my Friedman famously says, only surprise matters. So if you announce, pre-announce changes in monetary aggregates and don't make discretionary policy changes to adjust employment and so on, then you will be able to maintain a particular rate of inflation. Now neoclassical economics new classical economics builds on this framework. It uh, builds on the idea of a natural rate of unemployment. It builds on the idea that only surprises in economic policy can bring about deviations from the natural rate of unemployment, so that if you didn't have surprises, you'd be there. And it builds on the idea that deviations from the natural rate are temporary. And they locate or relocate the argument in, Mar in uh, Walrasian theory by assuming generalized perfect competition, complete price, wage, and interest rate flexibility, perfect arbitrage, continuous market cleaning, clearing, and the absence of money illusion, so that what matters is only relative prices, not the price level. But they add a new concept, which is Lucas's and Muth's actually famous idea of rational expectations. Now let me say that, first of all, expectations are not new in economic theory. Uh, they're the oldest concept. They appear in every discussion of markets and financial aspects. And uh, Marx has a famous quote that uh, um, a spider is as, as good or better architect than the best. But the difference between the architect and the spider is that the architect conceives the output first in his mind. It's expected. The outcome is an application of his expectations and anticipations, whereas in the spider, it's done automatically. And certainly in talking about markets, financial markets, interest rates, commodity prices, trade, and so on, all the classical economists mentioned that expectations and outcomes are not necessarily the same. Uh, and Keynes also makes that point, for instance, that since firms have to produce for the future, they produce a good, and it takes time. 
any production is based on expectations of what's going to happen with the sales of the product, the price and quantity, when you get there. So you might say, you might say that once you admit the idea of time, then you must admit the idea of expectations, obviously, also. What distinguishes rational expectations from all the others is a particular set of claims rooted in the neoclassical assumption that all agents possess perfect knowledge of the present and the future and employ this knowledge in a hyper-rational manner to, to achieve their goals. Muth, Muth, for instance, argues, 1961, that agents that supposedly exist within the model cannot be assumed to know something that the modeler doesn't know. He says, well, look, you just made up a model. You're saying that this is going to happen because they don't know this is going to happen. But if you're going to be consistent in the model, then the agents must know what you know. And in that case, uh, and he says they must also make use of this information in an efficient manner. Now, there's no reason to make these assumptions, by the way. This is perfectly consistent with the neoclassical idea of perfect knowledge and hyper-rational expectations and so on. So his rational expectations hypothesis posits that even though individual expectations may not be correct, the expectation of the average agent must be stochastically correct because these are informed predictions of future e events and those ones who are wrong will be eliminated, so to speak, or corrected in the process. So in the end, the subjective probability distribution of in outcomes is going to be uh, similar to the objective probability distribution of outcomes. Now, Mut doesn't say how you can test this empirically. A typical neoclassical argument says, well, if it seems to correlate with certain phenomena, that's a sufficient test. This is typical uh, black box Friedman uh, argument that you don't look inside. You only look to see if it produces outcomes that seem plausible in light of the evidence. And as I've argued in last semester, it's perfectly appropriate to ask to open the black box and say, well, why are you making that assumption? You can't just say, well, because it fits some facts, because it doesn't fit other facts. When you do zoom in at the micro level, do people actually behave that way? You can ask that question. You can test it. And one might say that now behavioral economics is focused on opening the black box and looking inside. Yes? Okay. Okay, let me just finish this and I'll come back to your, your point. Notice from this point of view that if agents have rational expectations, then the only thing that can cause the kinds of behavior that you observe is if there's a surprise. And that fits back to Friedman's argument that only surprises matter. If it's known, then people can anticipate it and their behavior will take into account the outcome. That assumes, of course, that the agents believe the model, so to speak. And, and Ruth says that if you have agents in a model, you have to assume they know the model and believe the model. Um, and a further claim is that the character of dynamic processes is typically very sensitive to the way expectations are uh, formed and influenced in the actual course of events. Now, one could argue that people certainly form expectations, and one can argue that these expectations are influenced by what happens in the process, but it doesn't follow that from that, that people correctly anticipate what's going to happen, even if they expect it to happen. The example, obvious example, is Soros' uh, example of financial markets. Some people may believe that the financial market will keep on going forever. Others believe that sometime it won't. Others, like him, know that it won't. But as he points out, even though he knows that it won't, he doesn't know when it will not. In other words, the market's going up. At some point, he knows it'll turn around and come back. It doesn't follow that you can anticipate when, because that depends on other people believing that it's going to happen. It's Keynes' beauty contest problem, that the turning point comes about when a sufficient number of people believe that it's not sustainable. 
But uh, Soros makes the point that that number of people rises as you get further away from sustainability. So you have to have an objective criteria of sustainability. And as you get further away from it, then the probability, so to speak, of that turnaround becomes greater. So in effect, you know when it's going to happen, but you don't know when it's going to happen. You just know that it will happen. And that's the idea of bubbles. But it's really a broader idea that expectations that affect outcomes because they are shared will, can be realized only when some factors change enough to make those enough people act on that same set of expectations. Some of it could be that things collapse. I don't know how many people saw a movie called The Big Short. Very interesting, good movie. The, the book is better, so read the book because Peter Lewis is a very good writer and the excitement and build up in it is much nicer than in the movie. But the movie is pretty good. And the point of the movie is that it traces, it tracks a set of people who are viewed by their peers as lunatics because they've come to believe in 2003 and 2004 and five, that this thing is going to pop. It's going to blow up. And they have objective criteria for it. They look at the movie. They show you things. And, but nobody believes them. And then little by little, cracks start to appear. And suddenly, the very people who are saying that they're crazy are trying to do exactly the same thing, which is to short the markets going down and even lie about it in the process. Well, that's part of the process of social outcomes where beliefs can affect the outcomes, but it doesn't follow that you know when or even how exactly things are going to happen, because it depends on other people also picking up things. Neoclassicals get around this problem in a very simple manner. They assume that there is a single representative agent by which you can model the whole outcome. In effect, they reduce all the heterogeneity and antagonism and uh, differences and, and real objective hostility of one side to the other to a single agent. And that agent is supposed to know the outcomes. Now, that agent is both the expector and the, and the actor, so the discrepancy is eliminated in the process. Okay? I argued uh, in last semester, if you remember, in chapter three, about the idea that uh, argued for the argument in, by uh, the physicist Robert Laughlin, who says that there are no macro phenomena anywhere in physics or biology or anywhere in the so-called real sciences in which you can move from the micro to the macro in a form of a single representation of the micro. He says, on the contrary, as soon as you get to aggregates, the behavior of the aggregate is different from that of individual elements because their interaction creates a new emergent property, so to speak. And he says it's true of all phenomena in physics. Uh, and obviously, it's true in biology and so on. So anyway, that uh, you might go back and look at that chapter 3 in the book. So Lucas takes this argument from Muth. And you can see where he's going to try to fit it in. He says that the uh, uh, expectations must be model consistent, but also they must be hyper-rational in the sense of the uh, single representative agent who knows everything and can um, see the future in a stochastic sense. But then he has to still explain the same problem, which is that if there is a surprise, why do they move this way and not just simply jump up to the point E. So first he says, well, if they have the information and there's no surprise, in other words, they will jump from A to E. That was Friedman's claim also. But now Lucas says, but if they don't have sufficient information, there is a surprise. First they'll move from A to C, to, to B to C here on that Phillips curve. But once their information set is updated, and they see they will jump from C to E. So that's the jump. You might move a little bit away, but you can make the jump as soon as you catch on. And since the problem is a lack of information, that information is updated rather than persistent misperception 
built into the inability of workers and firms to judge. This is just a question of their realizing that the thing is general. As soon as they do, they'll move a little bit here, and then they'll jump right back up. So that's the Lucas jump. And it's consistent with the problem is a lack of information. Um, once again, only unexpected changes in policy, i.e. surprise, will even cause this temporary movement because it takes you a while to update the information set when you have a surprise. This implies that the difference between Friedman and Lucas is the degree of the time spent away from uh, going from A to E. It's the path. In Lucas, it's a temporary deviation. You jump up to the top. In Friedman and Phelps, this could be a much longer process. A stronger argument, a more distinctive feature of the new, cla new classical argument is Lucas's uh, adoption of the argument by Muth and Walters that the structure of a macroeconomy is itself the result of dynamic optimization, optimization by representative agents. Now that's a, a very typical new classical argument coming from the Lucas and Muth Walters side. And that basically says that there is no structure which is anything other than the uh, behavior of these representative agents. Now, I, I've argued already against exact, uh, the exact opposite argument that, in fact, multiple heterogeneous agents with conflicting goals and conflicting interests, so to speak, uh, act on their local uh, outcomes and that the result is a stable structural pattern. Uh, quite different from that of any intentional behavior of the individual. You can see why I'm not a fan of DSGE models or anything of that sort, because I, I think that stuff is just completely, totally wrong. OK. Now I have a little bit of time to talk about uh, real business cycle theory. I want to make sure that I get to that, because uh, uh, I want to begin next time with Koletsky and uh, Post-Keynesian economists, Taylor, Lo Godley, Lavoie, and so on, and uh, then Goodwin. The real business cycle theory argument, as I said, adds on continuous market clearing, clearing completely flexible wages and prices, only temporary mis misperceptions in the face of surprises. Uh, I'm sorry, then temporary misperceptions in the face of surprise become crucial in explaining certain correlations and patterns that you observe empirically. And that is, over the business cycle, you see certain patterns of correlation. Uh, Nelson and Plosser, uh, which is a, the important um, authors in this discourse, showed that the path of observed real output could be viewed as a random walk with drift. And the idea of a random walk with drift implies that you have to explain the shocks that create this process. Kidlin and Prescott proposed that random technology-based productivity shocks can generate aggregate fluctuations that mimic actual ones, even under the neoclassical assumptions, new classical assumptions, continuous, perfect market clearing. Because if you have continuous market clearing, demand and supply are always equal, full employment is always holding, then you can't have deviations from that. So now you have to have a shock coming from somewhere else, and their idea is it's coming from technical change as a random shock. And that, they show, can mimic some of the patterns in the aggregate economy. So notice here that you have hyper-rational agents optimizing under perfect competition, continuous market clearing, completely flexible wages and prices. So at all times, you're in equilibrium. Yet, 
if you add shocks to productivity, let's say, then you can get aggregate shocks uh, and you can get movements, shock driven cycles, which are not business cycles as they were traditionally viewed as disequilibrium phenomena, but the cyclical fluctuating path of equilibrium, continuous equilibrium processes. And the problem for them, just as in Lucas's model, the problem is for the agents to distinguish the noise from the information. So they might move here a little bit, surprised by surprise, but then they'll jump and say, figure it out. In the case of real business cycle theory, the problem is how to distinguish between uh, the uh, temporary changes in productivity due to shocks and permanent changes due to the trend. And that's a signal extraction problem that appears if you make the uh, new classical uh, real business cycle theory uh, assumptions. Now, in this case, full employment always obtains because when uh, the labor market always clears continuously. So any drop in employment is due to the fact that workers substitute leisure for labor. So employment is always full employment, but of course full employment means people willing to work, looking for work. So if the employment drops, it's because people are, fewer people are choosing to look for work. And with this, you can try to build up a series of models that mimic the real processes. We know if demand drops, from a Keynesian point of view, you get unemployment. The real business cycle people say, no, you won't get unemployment. You'll get people choosing not to work. They substitute leisure for labor. And from this point of view, there's no distinction between the short run and the long run because you're always in continuous employment, full employment, and uh, market equilibrium. And so fluctuations and trends are inseparable because you get a stochastic process in which uh, the trend is, so to speak, driven by the fluctuations. The policy implication of this is that uh, given that all the observed economic fluctuations are taken to be Pareto optimal responses, of hyper-rational hyper representative agents to random shocks in a situation of continuous equilibrium in all markets, including labor, government taxation and spending policies can only do harm. Now notice how far the system has come from the time when Keynes is struggling to explain persistent unemployment and persistent misery in the 1920s to the time then by the 1980s and 90s where the argument is that, uh, and, and Keynes is talking about how the state will save capitalism to the point where in the 1980s and 90s you are talking about the state can do nothing but harm because the markets are perfect. You brought back the perfection of the market. The very thing that Keynes was trying to overthrow it restored completely. Um, calibration is a famous feature of these models since they don't bother to do econometric testing. They sort of build models that sim if you give them the right parameter values give you patterns that look something similar. Um, these have been highly criticized by people who are not impressed by this including many Nobel laureates from the might be called the neoclassical Keynesian side people like Tobin and Solow and others but still uh, they became uh, highly popular, at least for a while, even though the empirical testing works out to be quite bad. They don't function very well. Um, and I t in the book, I talk much more about the details uh, about the empirical testing of business cycles and so on. Uh, let me add one more thing, which is what might be called new Keynesian theory, because I want to mention this before I move to post-Keynesian theory. New Keynesian theory shares the basic foundation of new classical theory. But unlike the real business cycle theory that says the markets are always perfect and always in continuous equilibrium, new Keynesian theory brings back the idea of imperfection, real world imperfections. 
they still retain the, most of them retain the assumption of rational expectations, but they uh, have to explain why nominal disturbances can be shown to have real effects, such as output and unemployment changes, which is exactly what Friedman was motivated by in the first place. And they do this by increasingly building uh, imperfections, that is, deviations from the standard base model. So what are these? Asymmetric information. Very important assumption that one set of agents has information that the other doesn't have, and this can explain uh, the behavior. Heterogeneous agents. As you know, in neoclassical theory, all the agents are typically assumed to be all alike, represented by a single agent with perfect characteristics. But if you bring in heterogeneous agents, then you can mimic some patterns. Uh, and of course, imperfect or incomplete markets, including sticky prices and sticky wages, so that continuous market clearing does not hold. And therefore, there's room for substantial quantity effects. Firms can be treated as price setters, which in this framework is treated as an imperfection in competition. And you can even combine, in the new, new, new neoclassical synthesis, rational expectations with intertemporal optimization by representative agents, costly price adjustments, imperfect competition markets for commodities, labor and credit markets, and so on. So the overall goal, as Snowden and Vane point out in new Keynesian economics, is to throw a bucket full of grits into the smooth running neoclassical paradigm. And every one of these little things you throw in there generates some implications. And you can say, well, I can explain this pattern in the real world if I make the assumption that this is not uh, perfect. But the result, of course, is that everybody's got a separate imperfection that they like. And, the, and they explain different things. And these imperfections can't be added up because they, in fact, invented as deviations from a ideal model that allow it to behave locally in a different way. And I have always argued against this. Uh, but I quote from Snowden and Vane, new Keynesian economics now, I quote, consists of a bewildering array, a, array of theories whose quasi-religious adherence to micro-foundations has become a disease. And that typically, the fact that the adherence to micro-foundations is the problem, has led to behavioral economics, the new behavioral economics, which now opens a black box, is utterly shocked to find that real people don't behave that way, and is now doing exactly the same thing for the micro that was being done in the theory, which is discovering imperfections in the neoclassical theory. Now, this is an infinite task because the theory is so bad that there are dozens of Nobel Prizes in the offing by showing that nobody behaves that way. And so huge enterprise of behavioral economics. But as Vela often pointed out, this is a bicycle repair shop because the aim is to keep the structure going. And Akerlof, for instance, says this openly. He says, well, we're incorporating new behavior observe behavior, but the object is to preserve the standard foundation, to extend it and save it. And of course, among these things is agent-based economics and um, uh, uh, simulations based on, on, uh, on the various, uh, I lost my place, sorry, uh, agent-based economics in which you can build little models and show patterns that simulate something in the aggregate. I, I personally think, by the way, those are like econometrics and mathematics and any other thing. Simulation is very nice. But the fact that you can mimic something does not establish that you've got a very good explanation for it. Because you can mimic something in a variety of ways, and you still have to ask which one of the ways is plausible from the micro behavior. So if you mimic, say, traffic patterns by an agent-based model in which the individual cars are behaving in an entirely improbable way, and then you say, well, look, it looks like traffic patterns, you could reasonably say, but I can mimic it in another way, and I also get traffic patterns, so how do we compare this? So yes, learn your agent-based uh, simulation, learn that logo, but understand that in the process, if you ask a bad question, you'll get a bad answer. So you have to be careful about what you ask. 
Now, this brings me to the point I want to begin with next time, which is that what's striking is that in this long journey from being overthrown by Keynes, being restored at micro level by Samuelson and Solo and others, and then being restored at the quantity theory and macro level, especially by Friedman, and then Lucas, uh, Phelps, Friedman, Lucas, and then all of the uh, new classicals and new Keynesians, you're moving increasingly in the same direction that post-Keynesian economics had moved. Already, we know that in the 1930s, Joan Robinson and Chamberlain were talking about imperfect competition. And Kolecki builds his whole micro-foundations on imperfect competition, though we know that his macro theory doesn't depend on that because his first version of the macro theory was based on pure competition. And it's easy to show it doesn't depend on uh, imperfect competition. So you have, on the neoclassical side, moving into this world of infinite imperfections, and the post-Keynesian side coming parallel to that with the world of perhaps finite imperfections. Uh, imperfections of monopoly power manifested as markup pricing, um, the labor market not giving, not coming to full employment because of whatever reason, and there are different reasons in the post-Keynesian. So I want to pick up next time the other imperfectionist story, which is post-Keynesian economics. I want to show you the parallel between these two sides. They look like they're fighting each other, but they're in fact working on a parallel track in many ways because the neoclassicals have joined that imperfectionist tradition not because the post-Keynesians have joined the neoclassicals, but the other way around. And that'll bring me to the key point, how do we get beyond this joint project of the neoclassicals and the post-Keynesians, not Keynes, post-Keynesians, of building it around imperfections. Keynes, as we know, rejects that. Kolecki doesn't need it, but he does adopt it. So can we get beyond that and talk about capitalism operating in a real competition and real macro without invoking the idea that imperfections exist. Because if you have imperfections, if you can get rid of the imperfections, then you'll be back to perfection. And that's a point that many good neoclassical economists have made. Well, OK, you have asymmetric information, no problem. We'll work on giving information to everybody. Then won't we have full employment? If you believe the problem is these imperfections, then you will get back to the full employment. But if you believe, as I do, that what you observe is the result of the perfection of the system of real competition, then you will get what you get, perhaps in a slightly modified form, and perhaps even in a worse form. But you will not eliminate the basic issue. So that will be the task for the lecture after this. <laughs>